Hi guys, and welcome back. This time I'm gonna answer a question that I've gotten from many patients and I've seen it on the internet. The question is, if I start taking a digestive enzyme, is that going to mess with my body's ability to make enzymes and do I have to take it forever? Stay tuned to find out the answer. So first and foremost, I'll just answer the actual question, which is no, the enzymes won't impede your ability to make your own digestive enzymes, although that's a totally great question to ask. And I know this because we have at least a teeny bit of clinical data, and from my own clinical experience, I've noticed this to be true too. So I'll link in the doobly doo down below. There was a, I believe, 2010 article where they took 20 patients with celiac disease who also had steatorrhea, so fat in the stool, and low pancreatic elastase, which is a fecal marker, a stool marker that shows that there's pancreatic insufficiency where the pancreas is not making enough digestive juices and that that can lead to fat malabsorption or fat maldigestion. So in these 20 subjects with celiac disease, they followed them for four years. And what they noticed was really remarkable. After four years, eight of the 20 subjects had actually discontinued the enzymes because they felt that it was no longer necessary and they were able to just maintain and have good normal bowel movements without the use of enzymes. So organically over the course of four years, almost half of that cohort discontinued enzymes all on their own and they said, you know what, I'm pretty good. Then what they did was they studied the subjects for that first year in particular, and they measured the stool, the fecal elastase rather, in those subjects at the baseline, at six months, and then at 12 months follow-up. And the first jump was the baseline. Now, the diagnostic criteria for exocrine insufficiency of the pancreas is a fecal elastase of like, 200. I think 200 on the dot is about the cutoff that people talk about. So 200 or lower is flagged by the lab as low. And these patients, these 20 patients had a average fecal elastase of 90. So they were quite deficient. Then after six months of supplementation, they got them all the way up to 212. So not stellar, but at least they're not fully in the red. Then at 12 months out, their number had gone up to 365. Now the first question, when you hear that first data point, you think, well, Duh, Dr. Deneza, of course, you get somebody who's not taking an enzyme and you measure the enzyme and then you measure it six months later when they're taking the enzyme, of course it's gonna be higher. But dear YouTube viewer, that is not the whole story because the dose was probably about the same for those patients at the six month mark where they took the first follow-up and the 12 month mark. And yet they got a significant increase. They went from 212 to 365 in that additional six months which suggests that it's not just an increase of that fecal marker because they happen to be supplementing with the thing. Rather, this is because their exocrine function of their pancreas improved after they supplemented with digestive enzymes. How freaking cool is that? And I've tried to wrap my head around it, and this is the best explanation that I can come up with. Are you ready? So here we have a very beautiful pancreas. You all know my artwork by now. And then here's just the intestines. So as we all know, the pancreas dumps its juices into the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum or duodenum, depending where you heard the word first. I learned it two ways in undergrad and grad school. Side note. So anyway, so the stomach acid will acidify the contents or the bolus of food and then that gets squirted into the first part of the duodenum and then the pancreas gets the memo as well as the gallbladder and they go, whoa, acidic stuff. We need to squirt out our juices to neutralize that pH. This goes back to my videos on low stomach acid and why having a very acidic stomach is so, so important. And you really need to start from the top down and you don't necessarily start with pancreas, but I digress. So stomach acid, very important, comes down and then the pancreas will respond by secreting juices and then that will help break down and absorb fat, right? So, and then carbohydrates to some extent too, but really pancreatic exocrine in insufficiency generally will show up as fat malabsorption and steatorrhea more than anything else, so fat in the stool. But if you think about it, if you have hardly anything coming out of the pancreas, so here's like <laughs> wind coming out of the pancreas, if you don't have enough juices coming out of the pancreas, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have malabsorption and maldigestion. You're not gonna break down and absorb your nutrients, your protein, your fat, your carbohydrates. You're not gonna absorb fat soluble nutrients like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, and vitamin E, and your omega-3s. You're not gonna get that fat balance and those fat soluble vitamins, as well as some others. There's other like minerals and other nutrients that need these digestive juices to really function and get absorbed. So you're gonna have malabsorption and maldigestion, and then that, this is the key, is inherently pro-inflammatory.
So now we've got inflammation soup a cooking, and then that's going to affect your entire body. So now we're, not, we're just not talking about the intestines anymore. Now your joints could ache, your brain could be foggy, you're going to feel like crap, pun intended, because you're inflamed, because you're not absorbing your nutrients worth a darn. And if you're not absorbing your nutrients, you know who is? The roommate who lives farther down the tube. Your bacteria, your yeast, whatever critters you've got in your gut, they're going to get more of an opportunity to munch on that fat, munch on that protein, whatever is not getting digested appropriately, they're going to have more access to it. And then that causes dysbiosis, which again is going to crank up inflammation. So now you have an inflamed body state and you've got inflammatory signaling molecules going God knows where in your body. Well, don't you think the pancreas would probably be affected by all of that boatload of inflammation? Heck to the yeah, it would. So you've got this, this catch 22 where something had to cause the pancreatic insufficiency. So for example, I've seen it in a number of cases of SIBO or people with SIBO. I've seen it in people who have celiac disease that is otherwise managed by a gluten-free diet, but they haven't made the progress otherwise and they still have issues. I've seen it in some of my IBD patients. It's not an uncommon thing to have an insufficiency of pancreatic juices. And what I've noticed is indeed is that supplementing with enzymes and finally digesting your food appropriately and not letting a lot of large proteins and fat and nutrients get down to your microbiome where they're easily digestible by the microbes and then that favors dysbiosis. If you treat that, if you can cut this off at the pass and make sure that you're digesting your dang food appropriately, then all the downstream stuff doesn't happen or it doesn't happen nearly as much. So now that inflammation that was churning up before, less of an issue. That dysbiosis from the malabsorption of the fat and the protein and whatever else, causing an imbalance in the microbes and then mucking with your system and causing inflammation, less of an issue. And that means that the pancreas itself is going to be less inflamed. I don't know if they've done studies on this. I'm honestly too lazy to look. But what you have is you're basically treating inflammation and you're treating the body holistically, which is kind of my jam, but you're treating the body holistically by giving those enzymes and supplementing when it's needed. And then eventually, and it could take years, keep in mind those celiac patients, they followed them for four years. But after a course of years or months, a lot of people are able to come off of those digestive enzymes because now their pancreas is less inflamed and they're able to make more of their own dang juice. Now, it makes me wonder too, if you think about the study, this is how my brain works. It's like, okay, eight patients discontinued the enzymes. So almost, you know, 40% of the cohort came off their enzymes organically because they didn't need them anymore. That's great. But what was happening with the other 60%? Could those patients have had SIBO, right? Like how common is SIBO amongst people who have celiac disease? Very common. Could those patients also have dysbiosis? Yes. Could they have autoimmunity? Yes. Could they have post-infectious IBS and that anti-vinculin autoimmunity? Yes. So it makes me think it's really compelling that 40% of people in that study came off of their enzymes because they were no longer needed. And it's very encouraging that people's enzyme numbers were coming up in the stool samples, at least for the first year that they followed them. But it makes me think, I wonder if those patients were treated holistically and other things were treated appropriately. I wonder if all 20 of the subjects could have gotten off their digestive enzymes and nobody would have needed them anymore. We'll never know. But that is my shtick. So don't really worry so much about the enzymes being a forever thing. Point blank, if you need them right now, you need them right now. And then you worry about getting off of them a little bit later. It is a Band-Aid of, of sorts, but I would take a Band-Aid of the natural variety a whole heck of a lot sooner than I took a pharmaceutical Band-Aid or a surgery if I were you. So I would say treat the thing that needs to be treated now worry about getting off of it later and give your body time, give yourself space to heal. Keep in mind that this might not be a, you supplement for a few weeks or a few months and then you're good. This might be something that you need to take for several years to treat the inflammation and get your body to a point where it's digesting appropriately again. And just have faith that your body is going to rebound and that your pancreas is capable of making those juices if you just take off that inflammatory load. Now, if you just watched this video and you were like, oh my God, I don't know where to go from here. I don't know, like, do I have this? Do I have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency? Should I get a stool test? How do I interpret it? I've got good news. I have two ways that I can help you beyond just YouTube videos. Although Lord knows I've got plenty of those. So go check them out. 
First of all, I do work with patients both in the state of North Carolina, where I'm located, and elsewhere. So if you are in another state or if you are not in North Carolina, I would love to work with you just via Zoom. Thankfully, a lot of this herbal medicine and nutrition stuff and the functional integrated medicine can be done largely via Zoom. I won't get to do visceral manipulation with you like I do with my patients here, and I don't get to build that rapport with you in person like I do here, but I can help you if you live in another state or sometimes if you live in another country. So go ahead and check out the link of the doobly-doo below and you can book at a time to speak with me on the phone and we can see if we're gonna be a good match for each other. The other thing is that I have an online course, FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days. Now this might not be as applicable to you depending on why you're watching this video, but certainly if you have this dysbiosis, IBS, SIBO picture and you worry about your motility, that could all fold into this because really FODMAP Freedom is a SIBO and IBS self-treatment roadmap of sorts. And that is gonna be really, really helpful for people with those diagnoses and quite possibly if you have celiac disease, because like I said, a lot of people with celiac disease have had SIBO or had SIBO. Now, FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days is not currently enrolling. We are already well into our fall 2020 cohort, but if you go to the link also in the doobly-doo down below, you can get on the wait list and then you will be the first to be notified when FODMAP Freedom opens up right around the new year. And you'll be the first to know so that you can register on day one and get the special bonus. I always do a special bonus on day one for people who are really committed and make that decision on day one. So don't miss that email. Make sure that you get emails from me. And I would love to see you either in Zoom or FODMAP Freedom in 90 days sometime really soon. This is either going to be amazing and hilarious or the most awkward thing I've ever done. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.